Welcome to our seventh week of virtual gathering. We will all be experiencing this time of isolation differently, but our gathering in this way reminds us of what is constant. And so we light this candle to remind ourselves and each other that Jesus Christ is the light of the world, a light no darkness can extinguish. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. The call to worship this morning is based on Psalm 31, which is the psalm in today's lectionary. Come, people of God, take refuge in the Lord, who listens when we cry out, who rescues us when we call, and who leads and guides us according to his unfailing love. You, you are, are our God. God. Our, our lives are in your hands. Let us worship God together by singing the song, Yours Be the Glory. Let us pray. Gracious God, you have shaped a place for us, made of love and held in grace. It is filled with the whispers of the ancients who followed you and sculpted our faith. Breathe into this place again that we may know your way, your truth and your life. Amen. This part of the service is where we stand out of the centre of our world and take time to acknowledge the First Nations people. Our call to this is a reminder that wherever we are, we are in the presence of God. And so we acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kula Nation, the first inhabitants of this land. We pay respect to Elders past, present and those emerging. 
On this fifth Sunday of Easter, we continue in the story of the early church and hear the words of both Peter and Jesus in the face of persecution. It's also Mother's Day today, and we acknowledge the strangeness of the day. For some, where there would have been gathering and celebration, there is isolation. For others, there is the freshness of grief or the sadness of years. To acknowledge Mother's Day today, we acknowledge the contribution of women of faith, mothers and others, by singing this song written by Carolyn Gillette and sung to the tune of Be Thou My Vision. Who comes to your mind today as you think of the women who have loved and shaped you and we sing this song, God of the Women. Prayer of Confession We cast stones. Sometimes we hurt others with stones, literal and figurative, that we hurl without thinking, when someone says something that bothers us. We cover our ears and shut them out. We block those with whom we disagree. Challenging them, cutting them down, disregarding them. We want others to conform to our standards not caring if they are good and faith-centred standards or not. We challenge and push aside those who seem different from us. We cast stones, loving God, and we are sorry. Please forgive us. Amen. Amen. Jesus said, Do not be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. Sisters and brothers, know that you can trust in Jesus, who freely extends mercy and forgiveness. Know that you are forgiven and loved by God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Amen. Welcome to the Readers, Theatre for 
Acts chapter 7 55 to 60 the story of the stoning of Stephen but filled with the Holy Spirit Stephen gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God look, look he said I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God but they covered their ears and with a loud shout all rushed together against him then they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him and the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul while, while they were stoning, stoning Stephen, Stephen he, he prayed. prayed Lord Jesus receive my spirit then he knelt down and cried out in a loud voice Lord do not hold the sin against him when he had said this he died reading from 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 2 to 10 from the New Living Translation like newborn babies you must crave pure spiritual milk so that you will grow into a full experience of salvation cry out for this nourishment now that you have had a taste of the Lord's kindness you are coming to Christ who is the living cornerstone of God's temple he was rejected by people but he was chosen by God for great honor and you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple what's more you are his holy priests through the meditation of Jesus Christ you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God as the scriptures say I am placing a cornerstone in Jerusalem chosen for great honor and anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced yes you who trust him recognize the honor God has given him but for those who reject him the stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone and he is the stone that makes people stumble the rock that makes them fall they stumble because they do not obey God's word and so they meet the fate that was planned for them but you are not like that for you are a chosen people you are royal priests a holy nation God's very own possession as a result you can show others the goodness of God for he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light once you had no identity as a people now you are God's people once you received no mercy you have now received God's mercy John 14 don't let your hearts be troubled trust in God and trust also in me there is more than enough room in my father's home if this were not so would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you when everything is ready I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am and you know the way to where I am going no we don't know Lord Thomas said we have no idea where you are going so how can we know the way Jesus told him I am the way the truth and the life no one can come to the Father except through me if you had already known me you would know who my father is from now on you do know him and have seen him Philip said Lord show us the Father and we will be satisfied Jesus replied have I been with you all this time Philip yet you still don't know who I am anyone who has seen me has seen the Father so why are you asking me to show him to you don't you believe that I am the Father and the Father is in me the words I speak are not my own but my Father who lives in me does his work through me 
just believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe because of the work that you have seen me do. I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works as I have done and even greater works because I am going to be with the Father. You can ask for anything in my name and I will do it so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Yes, ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. Thank you for the opportunity to just share briefly from the passage of 1 Peter. I'm one of those people that likes to have a title to a message. Sometimes the title directs where I want to go and sometimes the title is written after the message is completed. Today is one of those occasions where the title came first. As I was reading through 1 Peter, it kind of struck me that Peter is inviting us to change our vision of ourselves as the people of God. And so here is the good news that kind of struck me. God's perception for us, as it was for Peter, was not influenced by what Peter had done, nor was it of God's view shaped by who he was. It's the same for us. God's view of us is determined by who and what we are in Christ. I don't know whether you noticed, but as we read through down, read through that passage in Peter, there's a lot to do with stones. There's living stones, precious stones, cornerstones. There's stones chosen by God. There's stones rejected by people. There's stones that cause people to stumble. And there's even stones that cause people to fall. So why would Peter have such a special interest in stones? Now, it could be that he understood and knew the passage from Isaiah, or I wonder if it really reflects his first encounter with Jesus in John chapter 1. The fisherman Peter, his first encounter with Jesus, has his name changed from Simon to Simon Peter, Simon the Rock. Now, I've got to tell you, if you know anything about the gospel narrative, you know that Peter is anything but rock-like. And yet, we are reminded throughout the biblical story that names are significant. Adam named Eve because Eve was the mother of living. Jacob had his name changed to Israel because he was the one that wrestled with God. Joseph is told to tell Mary to name the child Jesus because Jesus was the one that was going to come and save the people. So names are significant. So Simon's naming wasn't random, but I've got to tell you, it is certainly ironic, because when you think about a rock, you think about stability, solid, dependable, firm, strong, reliable. And yet Peter was none of those. He was the exact opposite. He was rash, impulsive, changeable. So why would Jesus give Peter the name The Rock? Did he get it wrong? Did he assign the wrong name? Did Jesus make a mistake? No, we can say, no, Jesus didn't make mistakes. And so the answer to that question, no, he definitely got it right. So what it's actually telling you and I, that when Jesus called Simon The Rock, he didn't call him The Rock because of who he was, because he knew what Peter was going to become. You look at the rest of the biblical narrative into the New Testament, particularly in the book of Acts, and you find Jesus, uh, Peter is one of those people that is transformed by the knowledge of the resurrection. The Spirit of God comes upon him and he's transformed. He's one who stands up against the religious leaders. He stands in the face of the government of the time. He continually speaks about Christ, even though he's thrown in jail. He refuses to stop testifying about the fact of the resurrection. He constantly recalls people to follow Christ. That man who he saw as unreliable now is a solid and dependable identity that shapes the growth and direction of the church. So when Jesus looked at Simon, he didn't see an unstable or an unreliable person. He saw a man of courage and leadership. And I know that there are smart people, all of you at Gladstone Park and Scotts and Airport West, already ahead of me here. You've already jumped to the application. 
that God does not see what we are. He looks at what we can be and certainly what we will be. Peter is reminding us to reframe our vision. Stop looking in the rear view mirror of what we have been and what we've done, our old self, and start seeing ourselves in the identity of the transformational work that Christ has done in us. As Christians, we can spend too much time with an emotional scorecard. In that emotional scorecard, on one side, we've written all of our mistakes and our squandered opportunities and our regrets, things done and said. We've got a list of all of our flaws. And on the other side of the card, we, we, we kind of list all the things that we think we've achieved. The things that even we think we're going to please God. The things that we use to cover the deep hunger that resides in our soul. The things that we think are going to make us feel better about ourselves, our power, our possessions, our knowledge, even our biblical knowledge, we put on our card. And on that card are the things simply derived from self-edit. And so it's time for a fact check. God sees what we are. Yes, that's true. God knows all of us what we've been and what we've done. Nothing is blind or hidden. He knows our heart. He knows our history. The things that we're proud of and the things that we're ashamed of. God is under no illusion and yet God still calls us. So here's a little simple experiment. Take that emotional scorecard and hold that in your left hand. And in your right hand, Take the passage of scripture that we've read today from 1 Peter chapter 2. And I ask the question, which one has your heart? Your own scorecard of failures and frustrations and doubts? Or the card that says, you have a new identity. A new identity in Christ. An identity that says we are followers of the living stone. Yes, the one that humans reject, but chosen by God. That's our identity. I know that Peter may be referencing back to the book of Isaiah, and he is equating Jesus with God, the Lord Almighty. And I think he's making that point, but he's also making a bigger point. He's making the point that there is no neutral or middle ground when it comes to how we relate to Jesus. Jesus is not a stone that sits on the side of the road that you can walk past. Neither is Jesus a stone in the middle of the road that we can walk around. Jesus is either an offensive trip hazard or he is a precious, he is a precious cornerstone that gives life its foundation. And if I see Jesus as the precious cornerstone, then I too am a living stone because of who and what I am in Christ. And then that opens a whole new door, another level of my identity, that I am part of a network of temples and priests. And that as a living stone, I am a priest with a profound responsibility to work for others to pray for others, for those that cannot pray for themselves. And so in closing, what kind of stone is Jesus to you? Is he a precious stone, a living stone, a cornerstone? Is Jesus the foundational stone of your life that holds you at this moment, even in isolation and disconnection from others? How you answer that question shapes how you see yourself now. And it also provides a window or a vision, a reminder of whose we are and what we are becoming. Those who place their trust in Jesus as their rock have had their past reframed. They now have a new identity, a new role. A new destiny that is out of this world. 
and most of all, they are free from that nagging voice at the back of us that keeps telling us that we are failures. And that, for me, is worth celebrating and belonging to the kingdom of God and to remind ourselves that it is in Christ and Christ alone. Will you join me in singing this song? I know it may be unfamiliar for some of you, but this is a song that I think shares the heart of what Peter is saying. Grace and peace be with you. We invite you now to join us in the prayers of the people. Lord Jesus Christ, chosen and precious cornerstone, we stand before you as living stones, chosen too, precious in God's sight. Hear us as we offer our prayers for the people for whom we seek mercy and the places where we seek blessing. We pray for reconciliation and justice wherever there is conflict, abuse or oppression. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are sick, hurting, fearful, despairing, or grieving. Lord, in your mercy, 
Hear our prayer. We pray for those who work for good with integrity and faithfulness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the whole of Christ Church, with all its life, prayer and ministry. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift up to you, O God, the names of all those we carry in our hearts, for whom we would especially seek God's care. We pray that we who are your people and have received your mercy will shine your light into the lives of all those for whom you are yet a stumbling stone. Help us all this day to be living stones and not dead weights, dreaming dreams and living gloriously the joy and kindliness of a faith that edifies everything that life should be. In the name of our Saviour, our cornerstone, we pray. Amen. Amen. And we gather these, our prayers, those which we've spoken out loud, which we've prayed in our hearts, and those that are yet we are yet to give voice to, into the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed is by your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. On earth as in heaven, give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from a time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Amen. a close, I want to remind you not to let your heart be troubled. I remind you to trust in God and in God's Son, Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth and the life through whom we come to know the Father. And the blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, one God, Mother of us all, be with us all now and forever.
Amen.